Coach, thanks for coming on. Thanks for uh, agreeing to do this. It really means a lot to me. Thank you, Benus. Thank you. Thank you for calling. It means also a lot to me. It's the Tesco fraternity never fails, right? So I, I appreciate I appreciate the uh, how you, how you want to say the um, loyalty. <laughs> I, it's been there from the first moment we we have met. You you came to my office. Uh, I I asked you to to stay in a coaching st uh, staff. You had different dreams. You choose your path, and I'm happy that you're happy. Yeah, we're we're all choosing our path, but you know, nevertheless, our 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 paths cross for a short moment, and it we still stayed in 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 the same fraternity no matter what. So I I appreciate it. But before before we go into this into the bulk of this conversation, I would like to talk about this. Knife in the mouth. I know some people have heard the story. Maybe I I saw it, but maybe not everybody knows. And uh, I would like to you to share the story a little bit. Well, you know, sometimes in our job, um, you you trying to find ways to motivate players. Like not not all the time though, because there's a motivation to play for the for the CSK team, uh, for the uh, great organization, and uh, always trying to target the best. You know, out of there. So motivation should be. Uh, always there, but you know, coaches, uh, we're trying to find uh, some ways. So before the game one and the playoffs against Fenner, I was just saying to my players to motivate them, you know, like uh, media, they were going, uh, Fenner is losing players because of COVID, some of the players, but the significant players that they were there, Nando and uh, Guduric and the creators with the, bo the ball creators. I'm not saying that they were not missing significant players as we are missing significant players, but I was trying to motivate them and keep them always wired so I said, we got to go out there in a fight like like warriors are going with a knife to the to their mouth, you know, and, and, and crawling over there to the to the mud or trying to, to be as silent. But we're going to have the knife over here. So pretty much we, we were playing tough on that game and we won the, the game one. So preparing the game two, which is almost back to back, as you know, like with a day in between. Uh, I go, we said, okay, we had one knife. Now we're going to have two knives. So I used my two <laughs> fingers and obviously the players liked it. So that's why they were going with the fingers, uh, like celebrating the, um, the final four with this way. So they liked it. That was a good Yeah, th Those, those little things, they can change a season in the, or they can impact the season in the, in the, in the positive way. And they stick around for a long time. You know, those little things, those, as you say, inside jokes, you know, they're, they're very valuable. And I think people underestimated how much they mean to the chemistry, to the whole understanding on laughing about these kind of things. And they just kind of like, it paves the road for success sometimes, not always, but sometimes it does. Well, yeah, I a hundred percent agree on that. Like small things uh, bring big things back uh, uh, as a reward. Um, yeah. So, and especially if everybody is kind of uh, being wired and being connected. Uh, so uh, it, it seems that, uh, and it was obviously after that, uh, with the reaction of the players, that everybody was connected. Uh, they, they were waiting for some something, and uh, that came up to the air. It was um, definitely came out of my, you know, like uh, of my brain and that preparation, in the morning shooting around uh, before the game won. So yeah, the, the little things I agree, like uh, the chemistry is very important. And uh, if players are, are all connected uh, to the same spot and nobody's like, you know, try to escape uh, yeah, yeah. and be motivated. Uh, this is this is very important. Yeah, those spontaneous. The silliest, I'm sorry, the silliest thing that it seems silly out there for for somebody, it might be very important for us. Exactly. For yeah. Yeah, it's it's it it all matters for the for the inside of the team, not the outside. The inside of the team, if yeah. it's valued within within the organization, within the team, that's all that matters, you know. And and a lot exactly. of times these gut gut decisions that you say, like before a speech or before you approach and you want to say something, you feel it in inside. I sh I should do it. I should do it. And then you do it, and then all of a sudden it just opens up the gut uh, the, the the gates, you know, and and and. Uh, success comes so i well uh, now i don't know about the final four i don't have a third uh, hand now we, we need to go with three or four <laughs> nice. something like that uh, yeah. um so you you've before we go I, I prepare four quarters for you um i prepare you know go through different topics but before, before we go into the different topics uh i would like to know a little bit more a little bit about your uh your, your past and uh 
all the success you had, uh, forgive me, is it fi 14 Final Fours now? The 14th coming up? Or... Uh, that's what they said. It was very tough to uh, count it. Uh, but after that, they, I, we counted together with coaches. It was eight as an assistant coach uh, and an uh, internum, uh, I mean, assistant coach and a head assistant coach with Jelko in Panathinaikos, eight yeah. and, uh, and six with uh, CSK as a head coach. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, that's like winner, winning never gets old, right? So you can just keep accumulating this. No, as... But, you know, we're talking about Final Fours, but nobody's bringing up the final of Cup of Cups with Pau. Uh, back in 1995, 96, actually, we played Basconia, or uh, unfortunately, the coach passed uh, uh, that he was coaching Basconia back then, or Tau Gres, or Tau, okay? So that's also important in my career, the final of Cup of Cups in Vitoria. <laughs> So yeah. we lost back yeah. then in 1995, uh, 90, uh, but some brought it up when we played the final in 2019 with CSK on the same court, the same court, actually, the Basconia dream, the Vitoria dream, <laughs> when we won the cup with CSK. So awesome. yeah, circulating, awesome. the life yeah. making circles. Cir the circle of life, yes. Um, you know, like, just to re rewind and, and think of what led to this success right like the what drives winning i mean i would like i don't would like to talk about the winning itself as much because may with all the respect uh, may they rest in peace for now but in terms of like how you got to the situation of 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 winning the path to it you know so i would like to know where was your first encounter with basketball and how did you how did you get into the sport how did basketball find you basically well, you, you're right about that. Like uh, more or less, basketball find find me where I found basketball, and I, uh, you know, I, I talk about that to uh, um, uh, the last gathering we had in my small town, actually village that uh, I, I grew up in, Trikala Matias, like three thousand population. Um, so uh, I was I was playing soccer in a in a in a in an age of uh, thirteen, uh, and I, I was pretty much good for the the coach and uh was 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 taking me not from the juniors from the uh actually the the, the youth uh, to the first team so i was practicing with with them and at the age of 14 15 i was like already i was establishing some status quo on starting on playing but back then we had a long hair so it, it was it was kind of Nice. I don't know, like the, the soccer players, you know. Was Mar Maradona was the Maradona was the inspiration exactly, for that? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be Maradona, but I was a way of being Maradona. But that's the story. He didn't like the the, the long hair, and uh, he pretty much saying uh, uh, that and always pointing that. Uh, what kind of hair is that? You gotta go and have a haircut or so. But like, I was like curious. Said, well, why, coach? You you care so much about my hair, like. Do I do my job or I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm competing pretty much. He kind of um, with his behavior, he showed me the way to go out of soccer and go to basketball. So uh, and um, I really own him. And I, I said that many times that he the way he uh, exposed me in front of the team, he, he kind of pushed me to the basketball and uh, mm -hmm. I started playing basketball and I uh, and uh, back in age of uh, 15, 16, 86, 87 and 87 exactly uh, when uh, at the age of 17, the Greek national team was winning the uh, uh, the first uh, European gold medal, uh, the generation of Yanakis, Galis, Fasulas, Christodoulou in, in Greece, uh, beating twice the uh, USSR uh, and, um, you know, Italy and, and Spain and all these big teams. Uh, it was kind of a re revolution for all the for all of us. So that's how basketball finds me through the soccer and the coach that actually kicks me out of the soccer because of my hair. Since then, <laughs> I had a, a you know my my hair firm cut. haircut. <laughs> but you know that what they said that um, if you hang around this, uh, um, a lot of times uh, uh, close to the barber shop, sooner or later you're gonna get a hair haircut. <laughs> so I I, do, I did took my haircut. I was. I was there, close to the barber shop all the time. Uh, that's that's funny, but you know what? Funny that you so say that. If I if I extend it, if you allow me, that um, yeah. you know, back then, also at the age of 17, 18, when you are really want to play ball, and I took a decision to go to Zagreb uh, back then, Yugoslavia, and to study physical education and and sports and and specifically basketball. Back then, Yugoslavia had one of the best, if not the best, championship in Europe. 
it was a united Yugoslavia and those those guys that they were competing in a, in a national championship uh, players of uh, Red Star of Partizan of Yugoplastica of Zadar of Cipona Zagreb that I was starting over there those are many of them they they found themselves after that in in NBA like of course Drazen Petrovic and Tony Kukoc and Dino Raja and and Paspal and Georgevic and, and Danilovic and those those guys were Ebrača so in 1987, it was the Universiada, University uh, yep. Games uh, in Zagreb, and they built a great facilities over there. Kukoc was the MVP, and Duda Ivkovic was coaching that team. Uh, two years before the European uh, champion in Zagreb afterwards. Uh, and uh, back then, it was not the internet, that, and the information are, are coming not that often to our, uh, us. So I was, I was trying to find information about the physical education. Uh, it was one case of uh, in Sofia in Bulgaria but uh, it was the second case in uh, Belgrade but Zagreb uh, had besides the facilities it was giving a, um, uh, a speciality of basketball or any other sport you want to choose and you become a, a head coach or a, a, a eligible coach of any sport at a division like a first division uh, so I try to make my phone calls and a lot of friends, they, they choose uh, Belgrade because it was closer to Greece, but I choose Zagreb, you know, and I, I, I never regret about that. Uh, and um, immediately on my first year over there, because I didn't know the language, so I have to go over there. And I went over there. Um, uh, by the way, I own a lot of my parents because, you know, when you said that that's a karma and you have a vision and a dream. So I had to follow my dream. I wanted to be teached by the best. I wanted to see that uh, like close enough. I wanted to, to meet Duda Ivkovic uh, desperately. And I met him in, uh, in 1989 uh, over there first time when, I, when he was a head coach of national team of Yugoslavia. So uh, it was, I, was, I was kind of lucky, but I was chasing my dream and I, I wanted to learn from the best. And as I said, my first year, I had learned the language. So I learned the language. But as you know, to learn the, the language good, you have to make good friendship. I had a, a lot of girlfriends and, and, and girlfriends. <laughs> and guys that they were hanging out and playing ball uh, in Zagreb. So I learned the language the first year. And um, uh, I proudly say now that I graduated on, on one of the, the best um, universities in Europe uh, of physical education, being studying basketball and physical education from Zagreb. Start my PhD over there. But then it came the call of Pau, starting also to work with um, juniors, a friend of mine since now, and again, how life is making cir uh, circulating. Uh, Igor, Igor Yukic, that he was the one that actually, after one of the three or three, or three games that we're playing, pick up games, and it was tough games, you know, like uh, to go, it was a basket that uh, defines the first division, the second division, and the third division. Like those those guys that they, they were not that good, they couldn't come to the first division basket and play pick up yeah. games. You, you had know? to get invited. <laughs> you have to be, you know, like, or, a lot of players that were injured. So after one of the pickup games, uh, many of those, uh, Igor comes out and uh, and says, hey guys, who, who wants to help me with a uh, mini basketball in Mladost? Before he finished his sentence, I raised my hand. I said, I'm gonna do it because I did it already in Greece and I'm very interested to teach. Uh, we were we were still in, uh, as I said, I was learning the language and I was on the first year of, ba of uh, academy. Uh, and this is where it starts a great friendship Igor now is the strength coach of CSKA soccer team with, uh, <laughs> yes, with Ivica Olic as a head coach of CSKA soccer team. And uh, like the, the last two months, they took over the, the CSKA soccer team. And we're together under the same, you know, uh, name, under the same big club, CSKA. Uh, and uh, that was the first invitation. Start working with Mladost, uh, not paid, of course, uh, with juniors and uh, Mladus back then in uh, 1989, 90, was celebrating their 50 years of existence. When the president asked me, who are you? The president of the club didn't know who I am. And I said, I'm working with the mini basketballs, you know, so <laughs> that's how it started. That's funny, like the circle of life, like there's so many, so many sliding doors moments, you know, that you, you can't really um, predetermine or you can't really predict. But also with, with all these stories you just said, to told me, of how things came together, you know, sometimes it's just um, by chance. But was there any time where you felt like 
it could have went a completely different way and not coaching? Like, was there a sliding door moment where it's like it, you could have turned the right right way on the fork and then just never look back? To be honest, it, it came to my life. Um, it came to my life in 1994 before uh, Pauk's invitation. Uh, so after Mlados, KK Zagreb asked me, and unfortunately also this coach, Pe Pepsi Bosco Bozic, is the past. And I'm, I'm very... Uh, you know, uh, thankful that uh, he called me and I work with him as an assistant coach and I work with a, a junior project. Uh, we produce great players over there. So in 94, uh, I was like without job and I, I, I was, I, I did graduate and I was waiting for some good call, but the call never came. And, mm -hmm. and, and I got a call to work in a different uh, job, which is uh, ice cream. So I, I did uh, almost a year being a, uh, a director of a Greek uh, firm, Evga, which is great and uh, quality uh, ice cream, to help the, uh, uh, them over there, um, you know, distribute and, and organize. So I work a little bit in, in business as a, as a director or a CEO, uh, having um, this connection between the Greek company and the Croatian back then company that, uh, uh, you know, uh, are distributing the, the ice cream. But that was not the word for me. I, I, I was like doing it very professional. I was doing it very, very concentrated. I try to learn uh, from the best as well. I, I've been in, down in Athens to in, in, in facilities of Evga to see how the ice cream is being produced, to how you have to teach the, the drivers to put it on the, on the refrigerator. So it was a, a short period of, of my life where I, I was not in basketball, like maybe six or seven months, but I had to do something else. And that was the, the, the moment when uh, uh, the call of Pau came. So, you know, I said, you know, big respect to ice cream, big, big respect to business uh, <laughs> work. I got to go to basketball. So pretty much it came to my life at that moment. But before that, if you ask me, before that, I was going very determined and very determined and very decisive in, in, in University of Zagreb to learn, uh, to practice, uh, none, none, uh, no, no, no limited hours, read, learn the language, uh, and being actually the, the year that I was learning the language, uh, I was going to university as a student because it was my a generation before me, uh, you know, they were, they were studying before me a year before, uh, I was learning the language and I had plenty of hours. So I said, hey, guys, can I, can I come and like see the, the lesson? I said, how? You're not, you're not a student. I said, who, who's going to find out? There were like groups of 34, 35. So kind of cheating. Uh, even though I was not student yet, I was going to the, um, you know, uh, watching basketball, volleyball, handball, swimming, uh, athletics, like track and field. And I was, I was going and joining the others that they're already being in the first year. I was so excited that I have to start. I couldn't wait of starting uh, uh, the university. So a lot of times, and one time actually a, a student uh, that he couldn't swim, uh, asked me, I said, can you, can you go and swim for me instead of me? I said, how are they gonna, they're gonna figure it out? Like, I'm gonna, so when they, when, they, when they say my name, you jump in the water and nobody's gonna figure it out. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it because it was, it was too, too, too scary and too, but uh, I was close to, to do it because I was going very often, even though I repeat again, I was not a student. So, but I, I didn't do it. Yet. Well, it's like, you know, when you're um, in, a, in a different city in Paris and there's a tour guide and then you, there's a, a group of, of, of tourists and then you just sneak in and, and kind of yes. participate in the tour. <laughs> that sounds but, like it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but uh, uh uh, at that, at that uh, example that you give, you don't pay money. Over there, I was ready to pay money <laughs> to learn, believe me. No, I believe you. I believe you. Um, so talking about, let's, let's move into the first quarter of, of this game that we're about to play here. And uh, the ball goes up in terms of coaching. The first topic is coaching specific. So the, I, I'll start off with a story that I felt that um, I went to a car wash. I don't have a car, but I, I took the car from my dad of my dad to go to the take to, to the car wash in Lithuania. And you know when you walk when you drive in, there's sometimes some car washes have this belt, and then you just drive in, you leave it in in in, in neutral, and yeah. then it just. So I did that, and that was I I've, I haven't done that in uh, I don't think ever because I used to do it manually, and I, I let it there, and 
I had to let go of the wheel, you know, like you have to let go of the control and trust the belt to take you through it. And then you come out clean. So I, I that's the first time I had a, like epiphany. I was like, oh my God, like this is, I, I'm a control freak. I cannot let go of, of the wheel. I cannot, I can't, I have to really grasp the situation. It was really like a paradigm shift for me in terms of like my own personality. But I was wondering in terms of coaching, when do you let go and when do you control things? How do you feel the situation of what you can control and what is out of your hands? Because coaching is so much more in the hands of the players than, than people think. Well, uh, you put it the uh, right way and I'll, I'll help you with that. I'll say, I'll say the quote that uh, Fon Karagan says, and uh, if um, our audience, they don't know who is Fon Karagan, they can, uh, they can go and search. Fon Karagan, if you don't know, is one of the, the best masters in the, in the world. So he says, the best leader needs to know when to leave the bottle down and let the orchestra play. Hmm. So you got to trust the orchestra. So a lot of times you, you put it w- w- well enough, like you said, the, the example with the car that you have to trust the belt that is going to uh, do the job. Uh, a lot of times you need to trust your guys, but you got to bring them to that level. So you got to bring them to that level where now they can go, you know, and that's the limited hours meetings um, that you have individual group meetings on, on the bus, on the plane, on the meeting, uh, on the video session, uh, maybe uh, some lunch, maybe some din- dinner with the players. Those are the hours you bring the player a lot of times out of their comfort zone. So you bring them to that automatic zone where they can really play the song by themselves. And uh, it happened to me many times. There are things that you can control in your in, in basketball career. And there are things that you can control, especially with this epidemic. When yes. I prepare the team to have this certain amount of players, and the next morning the doctor calls and says, you know, you can count on two. They got COVID. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. and we're about to fly and play the game. Uh, that's what happened pretty much on a, fir- on a game one against Barcelona. I was preparing the team with these players. They said, oh, no, we have a false alarm. That's that's a false test. That's a false uh, positive. But now you don't have those two. <laughs> uh, and then it's pretty much those 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 things are. And this is what may, it pissed me off. Uh, and I'm sorry for my language, but those are the things that we can control. If it's a pick and roll defense, if it's a post defense, if it's a transition defense, if we don't share the ball well, those things you can work pretty much in a game. Uh, substitutions, timeouts. The the game of basketball gives so much of a leverage to the coach competing with other sports. Uh, Because I had talked a lot with other sports and coaches, especially soccer, that uh, they they cannot interfere during the game so much how we can interfere into the game. Uh, And they do have a lot of interference, though, with different techniques. But still in basketball, like also in other uh, uh, games, the coach can interfere more. But to come back to your question, you need to bring to the team to that level. You need to trust the team sometimes that they can they can really run the show. And I, I did have that in 2019 in the final four uh, that ends uh, with us uh, bringing the trophy home. Uh, we've been uh, through a lot of adversities. And actually, what defined us for that year was our biggest losses. It was our biggest falls. But we decided to fall not back, but to dis- we decided to fall forward. Mm-hmm. So we had losses like, uh, a bad losses and upsets like Budushin's game. And, you know, kind of you feel the, the team. If I give that example, we start a game against Budushin's and we are 11-0 or 0-11 because that was a road game. And, you know, the coach, the other coach, uh, Alex Jikic, is calling a timeout. And I'm yelling to my players. And the players are looking at me like, coach, we're, we're all 11. Like, why? But I felt that the team is playing kind of, nonchalant you know like we, we were playing we were not there we, we were leading yes zero zero eleven everybody will say like you know but you feel your team that it's not the moment you're not playing yes, correct you yes. don't respect the game enough the the old eleven is because of that 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 nothing and i don't know advocate is what you know the, the devil is the advocate over there or however you call it the game turns around they hit some crazy shots they had some turnaround shots 0.4 to the end of the shot clock, making three-pointers. Amazing game for Buducinus. And one of our best uh, rebounders and a, and a player you, you, you had the privilege to coach, Kyle Hines, 
loses his man under the basket, a guy grabs a rebound, scores, and we lose the game. Uh, and that that's a, a painful loss. That's a, a, a loss that you, you don't want for the team, especially because it was Thanksgiving and the guys, they were preparing with the families to make a party mm -hmm. and everything. I cancel all the parties and everything. We had to be like six hours in the gym and challenge them and, uh, and go strong. And that game helps me to say, you, you remember? You remember that time out 0-11? We were 11 up. And I was telling you that we need to be alert. That game, it doesn't go well because of that, that, that. Like, why are you giving to go right? I remember it's a, it's a video over there. We can see it on YouTube. Uh, uh, that I said to Danny, why are you giving to go right? We said, close the right. Why the hell he goes right? And we were 11 up. So it is that moment, that, the moments that the coach can use it in, in his, uh, on his benefit. And, and then uh, the season after that goes even, even harder. We'll lose against Maccabi a home game 17. They outscored us, they outplayed us, they out they, they out hustle us. You know, that that's another painful loss that defines us. Going further in a playoff series, having the home court advantage, uh, which I'm privileged to say in the seven years we're over here. Actually, one year we never ended because of COVID, but in six years we played the playoffs, we always had the home court advantage. But never we lost a home court game with a system of 2 2 1. You know how it goes. But then Vitoria is tied the game on the series on the series of five, best of five. Vitoria ties the, the game. And then now we have to go to Vitoria, play, playing them on the road. Uh, and you know how tough is playing against Vitoria. So that, that was another painful loss, but the team really united. And, uh, and th those losses, uh, because we had a character, because we, we, we knew what we represent. We knew what we, we have to get out there on the court. We push the players a lot. We push them out of their comfort zones, like Nando, like Corey Higgins, like Will Clyburn, like Kyle Hines, but they all respond at the end of the, of the day. And uh, we, we brought two uh, great wins on the road and we came back on the final four and win the final four. I mean, I said it really quick, but I'm trying to say those moments that they were very painful losses uh, kind of defined us and we use it as a if I may say it as a as a as a weapon in uh, in our arsenal coaches to motivate players and to challenge them yeah it's like a reflection right like yeah. you you're thinking about of remem remembering of what happened before to impact the future and that's the the gray area that not many um, you know people understand that recognizing and I talked to Andreas about it as well and he said the same thing was, you know, recognizing where things are going good, but we're not doing the little things that lead to something bad later on. And, and they, they can impact the season in the wrong way. You just because winning losses over a lot of things. And, and if you're not critical enough with yourself, with the players, with the with with anything, then all of a sudden it's just a snowball effect and it can take you downhill and you can never recover from that. If you don't apply the fundamentals, the principles that you're teaching all year long. So those losses. And those situations are, it's important to recognize them. And it's also important to remember the, the, the losses and, and to point them out and always bring it up when the, when the same occurrence. It's just like you said, use it as an example. And, and, and moving forward, you fail forward. Um, well, definitely because winning teams, and um, uh, I dare to say that uh, my team and our team, CSKA, is a winning team and it has a mentality of winning team. Does not get used to uh, upsets. So, you know, when you prepare and also in soccer and also in volleyball and, and when you go and see some, uh, some crushes, uh, when you have a big upsets is because those teams, the great teams in all sports that I mentioned, they're, they're not get used on losses and they handle the, the momentum. Let's say in a soccer, you're playing great. You, you, uh, you're shooting the ball um, consistently, but you can't score. And then you receive one goal on the 80, 85th minute. And then you're like, what? Yeah, you know, like yeah. we shouldn't lose that game, you know, like or you, and then the second goal, and that's you're you're with the with the back to the wall. So pretty much it happens with a with the basketball and with other sports too. So you you pretty much you need to prepare the uh, the players for that, and it, it may happen. So you you need to actually consistently um, remind them. But let's let's say this also: there are not all players ready to to accept criticism or to accept being out of, of the course. comfort zone. Uh, they're not all players ready to handle it uh you know this is where it, it comes now your captain uh the teammates 
uh, or the preparation you already did in the summer. I used to talk a lot to the players before I recruit them. And I'm telling the, like, uh, the, the whole, honestly, uh, how it's going to look during the season. You know, I don't want them to come and after they say, coach, you know, I was thinking, and everybody says, you know what I'm saying? I'm ready to do no matter what to win. So yeah. you remember what you said in summer? I'm ready to do no matter what to win. So no matter when to do is to sit on the bench and somebody else to play, then that's what, what, what you have to do it. Yeah. And then they look at me like that because, you know, let me let me joke a little bit. Like I, I said that to a player, though, like uh, and it, it's normal. You're going to face it here uh, sooner or later than ever coaches, young coaches or or uh, pretty successful coaches. They, they face it for sure. Like, hey, coach, why you stop me now? You know, I said, look inside. Do they play five? I have five players on the court. You look at me. Oh, of course. I said, OK, I'm not I'm not hurting my team. Am I right? So instead of you, somebody else checked in. Am I right? So actually, you're not going against me. You're going against your teammate. Yes, that's a good point. That's they, a good point. That's a good point. And then the team turns and then we win. And I say, OK, coach, sorry, you're right, like 100%. Like, like you, you don't have to go to me. I'm here to help you. Tomorrow is going to happen vice versa, that thing. So of course, we got to have rules. And of course, players that they lead the team, they have to uh, need to have a little bit of a different treatment because you know mistakes and turnovers are part of the game. But we have living examples when in the playoffs against uh, Red Star that it was the underdog and we were the favorites uh, before the 2016 Final Four. In a game one, everything goes south. You know, whatever we prepared, we don't make shots. Nando and Teo, uh, Teo they're they playing the, the kind of, I can say, they're competing to each other who's going to miss more. So <laughs> great players, you know, our, our leaders, yeah. uh, like, and the game is is live, you know. Uh, and the game one, we all know how is the game one. It's all the surprises happen. Most of the surprises in the game one. Yep. So, I had to sit both both of them in a in a clutch moments. And then Jackson brings the energy we wanted to. And other players brings the energy. And uh, then all of a sudden, I bring one of them in, and Theo makes a shot, and then Nando, uh, and then when when I talk with both of them afterwards and the, uh, before the game too. And they say, you know, I'm saying, but coach, why you have to take this both? You know, you, you could have had at least one of us. And I said, that's my that's what my gut said at that moment. And, uh, you know, the, the team reacted. I'm not saying it's right. Now I can judge that that was the right decision. But that's what I said to the young coaches. You got to feel your guts. You, you got you to trust your guts. You know, and the, of course, this comes with the experience as well. Like experience, you can't go and buy it out there. You got to experience it. You got to lose. You got to get some punches. You got to. You got to have some upsets. You got to have some bad losses. You got to lose the trophy. Everybody's going to criticize you. Hey, how you can't handle that team of, of, of a great budget or a great roster. Yeah, it happens. So uh, this is, it comes with the experience. Out there. Yeah, that's, it's a, uh, I'm a big, I'm really big. I'm an intuitive communicator. I'm an intuitive. I listen to my gut a lot. Um, and that's also why I have, I'm really big on nutrition. So my gut is healthy as well. <laughs> so, so I can make the right decisions in life. And it's, it's really important, I think, for, for coaches um, to understand, or I mean, it's not only coaching, it's management. It's, uh, when you deal with people, I think in general, when you deal with people, when there's so many factors that you can control, you have to listen to your gut. Sometimes it's based on experience. Sometimes it's just intuition in that moment that you see you feel it, you, it's unexplainable, right? You know, it's data is big these days and you have numbers to justify things, but not everything you can't, that's, there's humans out there that are playing and there's humans, inter, human interactions that you can't, you, you have to really make a gut decision. And I think it's important that you have to trust that gut and, and roll with it sometimes. Well, you brought something uh, in, in your statement right now. You said about management, you said about many factors and you said about data. Data are, very, are great and I, I, I trust data a lot. But I, I need to trust my assistant coaches. I need to trust my uh, my doctors, my physios, and I need to trust my guts as well during the game because the game is live, and the other coach is also prepared for you. Uh, he prepares some other tricks. You know, the the game it goes south, as I said. Uh, your main player got three fouls early in the game, also whatever you gotta be prepared for the plan B or plan C, and management is very important to to that factor. You know, um, we could not achieve what we have achieved over here if the management the andre or everybody would not keep us over here and trust us 
that, that that's normal. But as a coach, you got to be ready to get fired on the first yes. moment. Like, <laughs> you know, you got to be you got to be ready for that. But as soon as you are, you know, trust your job, your work ethics, as I said, your 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 assistant coaches, your players, you got to be ready to um, follow your ethics uh, and um, and put your your you know put your uh, fundamentals out there. What you want to, uh, uh, the team look and try to build uh, the the right um, you know the, the right atmosphere, as you said, and uh, because tradition is not winning, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the atmosphere is winning over there, the chemistry you're, you're, you're building, so the culture. So wins and trophies are buying time for coaches to establish their philosophy even, even more and to actually work on it. It is buying time for us. That's what it is. Of course, it is a glory and everything like probably money and extension of contract and everything. But actually what, what, what is a deeply inside in the coaching world it is buying time for you as a coach to, you know, to go with more years to establish and to coach also the management, the, the people are around you. Hey, this is a good way. It works. The system works. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the, the process, right? Like there's a process yeah. behind everything and you have to also see the nuances. Sometimes you lose, but you're actually winning because you played the right defense. The other team is just making tough shots and you just have to move on. You have to look past it and move on into the, you know, into your team's development. Um, so if we just, um, before, before we move on to the organizational second quarter about organization and communication part, I would like to ask you uh, if you can describe what means uh, playing well to you. Like if Tesca plays well, what, how do you see and what, do you, what does it mean when you see, okay, now this is, this is what I want to see. This is like, can you have like three or four things that you feel like is are essential for a good game to, for you to see? Well, essential for, for me is um, to respect the job you did and to respect the club you are in and to respect our principles. There is, um, there is a, a fundamental for us to compete. And uh, listen to what I'm saying, not just to play hard. I think for that level in uh, playing for Ceska or playing for Fenerbahce or playing for, for uh, Barcelona or playing for FS or playing for Milano or so whatever, Real Madrid, it's evidently, it's, it's, it's actually something that if you don't have it, then you don't belong in that team, like playing hard. Or, am I right? Or practicing hard. Yeah. Uh, but to compete, it's very important to, to say to yourself, at the end of practice, today I did compete. Or at the end of the day, today I did compete. I, I play honestly out there. I did what, what my, my, my coaches asked from me. I was honest out there. I was not trying to cheat. I was giving all my best over there to compete. I was focused and concentrated all the time, and I was motivated. Um, concentration and motivation are two factors that if one components that if one you miss, then you, 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 it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You need to have in each practice and each game both. That's why I said to many players, like you know, sometimes guys, if you don't feel it, you better come before practice and tell me, hey, coach, sit me down, sit me out today. It's not written over here in your forehead that you don't have a good day today. Yeah. Or other days when I prepare my, my veterans and I say to them, and this goes to the communication, today, be ready, I'm going to go on you hard. <laughs> Coach, why? Yeah. Because, I, because that's the way to wake up the team and to do like we had in the winning teams. And that goes uh, to that part where I said, we got a winning streak of 20 all right? Like we had, I don't know, 12 wins in a straight in, in a, Euro League and eight in VTB, so we go 20-0, and all of a sudden we feel giants, uh, we feel undefeated. No, that the loss is somewhere there and is waiting for you. It's like, waiting for you. Yeah. Upset. So we don't want that upset to happen when it matters, but better to do it now. So you choose me, coach. You're the leader. I got, I, I, I gotta go from you. So this is also a part that you know uh, uh, we can use, and this is all that I'm, I'm saying and communicating to them uh, during the summer. And again, not everybody can accept that. But those that they accept, at the end of the, the season, they're going to come and hug you and say, you're right. And thank you for that. And it's well worth it in the end, right? When that happens. Like when you're, you know you stay true to your principles, you, you are following up what, what, you're always set to, what you're always set to do. And at the end, if it works out, it works out. It's even more gratifying. You know, if it doesn't work out, at least you can say you followed your principles and you did what you, what you, always, what you always wanted to do. 
exactly. So that's that's my answer to that question. So that's when I feel that my team, yes, we did it. When I feel that my, my team, it doesn't respect as soon as the ball goes up to the air, it doesn't respect our principles, it doesn't respect uh, the history of this club, the, the culture we have. It's important when you come to the culture that is a winning culture and that team has a success, it's easier for the coach. That's it goes to, to this, what I said, you know, like you, you buying time and you winning time to bring also some new generations because this is our third generation now in Seski. I yeah. dare to say in seven years, we have a third generation, the 2016 mm-hmm. generation. Mm-hmm. We took over from you guys, from Metore. You know, it became to 2019 that we're going now to 2020 with a different generation. Yeah. Uh, the core of the team, we try to keep it untouched. It's not, it's not easy. We have a lot of uh, uh, competitors out there like that they have a great budget and also system. So it, it was not easy for, uh, for, for Ceska, but still they're, we're doing a great job. The management, the sponsors are there. And that's a huge thing to have a, a stable uh, management and to have a stable sponsor uh, behind that. That's huge. That's the pillars. Without that, it's, we, we don't exist without that. Uh, it's, it's essential, right? I mean, that's for, for success, that everything, everything works out the way you're, you're really, um, it's, it's through communication, honestly, you know, like keeping everybody on the same page and keep everybody, everybody engaged and moving on into the same direction. And that's, that's the key. And my, my question to you was uh, on this part, on this communication part, was you mentioned the captain. It's like you. It's like you read my my sheet. You know, you you see you see everything I wrote here, and uh, like I'm no, I'm I can't, I can't <laughs> believe I come closer. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually prepared these these topics to talk about because the relationship with the captain is is essential, and not not, not many uh, coaches or or not many people from the outside understand the connection between the head coach and the captain, and I've I've witnessed that. In Lithuania, it's extremely important, the relationship between the captain and the, the head coach, and it's always the information exchange. So talk to me a little bit about uh, the, the information you're looking for out of the captain and what information the captain uh, provides you with about the team and that you also could relate to the captain that you find important. So what's, what's, what are some nuances there to understand? I'll give you two examples, though, that are very important for that, uh, for that topic. Uh, the example number one is my first captain, uh, Victor Hriapa, a great player, uh, many, many years in CSK. When I, when I call him to my office and after the second time we had the conversation, first time we had a normal conversation, everything like what I want from my captain and everything. But on my second conversation that was, uh, was a little bit more concrete and direct, allow me not to get into the details. Then Victor yeah. says to me, uh, but coach, I didn't expect that because with other coaches, it was not like that. I didn't expect that the relations will be that open, like you want that much from me. And I said, you're my right hand over there. You're, you're my, you got to go in the locker room and I feel safe. I go out and whatever principles we, we said, whatever we uh, like follow, what is the main idea? I need to feel right that you're going to uh, represent it to the, to the team. And when somebody is trying to, feel not good because he's not playing time or he's uh, he has difficult time at home or something. You got to be the one, you know? So he kind of felt like different regarding the other situation he was facing before. Mm -hmm. While with Kyle Hines, which is the second example, it was totally different. Both, they were not that vocal in the locker room. You know, Kyle, Kyle, how it is. But when he needed to, he was there for everybody and he was leading by example. That's very important. You can't, you can't say to Carl, he's not competing in practice. You, sure. you can't for say, sure. you, you can, you know, go out there and say, you know, you're not competing. You're not concentrate. Maybe he's not going to make his free throws. Maybe he's not going to uh, hedge. Well, he's going to do some fouls. He's going to miss here and there or something, but he, he can't say that he's not competing. So the captain should lead by, by example, definitely. And that's the third part, which is my captain now and a co-captain, Nikita Kurbanov and, and Will Clyburn. Those guys, they lead by their, their example, their living example for the others. And I, I like when I have such uh, uh, captains that I can challenge because the rest, you know, they're going to follow. Uh, I had this conversation with Greg Pogwich, great, great coach. Uh, when he says to us, when we visit San Antonio, we played a scrimmage back then with Panathinaik Cross. He says, listen, I have Tim Duncan. And when I challenge him and I, I criticize him, he's first. He's going to sprint first. He's going to do first uh, the thing. Then the others are just followers. Mm-hmm. They got to follow. So that's that's very important for for having captains that they're 
leading example for the others. And, um, you know, I usually talk more with the captain and I, I, I fully uh, agree with what you said about the relation of coach and a captain. I talk more, I explain him the situation, how the decision will go. Uh, and especially on the bad moments, also on the good, the good moments when the team is flying and uh, it looks like we're undefeated. He needs to, to put them all on, on the ground, uh, both feet stable, uh, stay humble, keep working. Coach now is challenging you. You uh, don't respond to that. Don't respond to that. You know, try to be not 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 that much distractive from the media or uh, you know this Facebook, Instagram, or whatever yeah. exists out there. Um, so pretty much, I, I'm not the guy that I want to learn everything what happened in the the locker room, whatever they talk or if they make fun out of me, how I criticize this guy. I'm not, I'm not the guy because you ask me like what I'm expecting from the captain. I, I, I expect from the captain. I don't want to have also other guys like physios or, or doctors to tell me to come and sneak you and say, hey, you know, this guy says that. I, I don't care about that. I have a straightforward relationship. And I kind of, with this experience, almost 30 years working in this job, I do understand the, the, uh, the guys on the court when I see their body language. I'm going to invite them mm -hmm. on an individual talk or as I said, in a dinner or lunch. And I'm, I'm going to open my heart and they're going to open their heart eventually. So I need, though, the, 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 the uh, captain and the co-captain to be on the same page uh, with me. But also, because it happened, and that's a, a true story as, as well, I can mention names as well, but... Uh, no, no, we, uh, we, we, my, my podcast, I would like to have, keep it without names and without any kind of... So there's like... We just it doesn't matter. It. I think it's more interesting, though, when it's again, names. But okay, I, 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 I trust Up what you, you said. But, um, you, you know, uh, when I had kind of a confrontation with a player, that's back then, all right? So it's not recent, so don't make any assumptions. So <laughs> the two captains, they came to me and said, Coach, we're ready to help you now. So, all right, that's why I have you. What, what do you suggest? Let's talk. All right, let's talk. So we talk, the three of us, and he says, okay, where you can do this, you write for that, for that, but can you do that to, to help this player to, to perform? I said, definitely. But that guy... I can push him out of his limits because that guy is going to save the day. And it happened exactly like that. And I, I really appreciate the, the moment when the captains, they came to me and said, okay, coach, we're going to find the solution. It can't work like that. Yes, we're going to find the solution. Thank you for doing that. So that's, then you understand that they feel accountable. You hold them accountable in the, in the summer when you explain them how the team is going to look, what, what the roster is going to look, you know, uh, the team is here financially to help us. We're going to sign this guy and that guy. They're very excited and they feel accountable for everything, but they proved it. When mm -hmm. they came and said, now we feel accountable. Now we're going to help you. We stay by you. Tell us what we have to do. And they did it. And that's, that's tremendous. That's, that's the most gratifying part, right? When it all comes together and you see that the, that the, the, the communication worked out you know, to everybody's favor, not, not to your favor, not to their favor, to the team's favor, to the organization's favor, and when when everybody's on the same page, especially the captainship and the and the and the head coach, it's it's a completely different um, you know team chemistry or team goals, team goal setting and 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 the path. Um, but when we when we talk about the the relationships, there's also relationships within within the coaching staff. And I was wondering also from your side. What's your expectation uh, on from your coaching staff in terms of like how you manage it, how often you meet, how important it is for you to get feedback from them, what feedback you're looking for, the arguments you have. It's important to argue and disagree because you have to also find ways to you know to be on the same page and to have the right the right tactics in, in, in place. So what's your what's your um, approach to your staff? Am I going first? My podcast first goes. Or Andreas goes first, so I, I have to know. What can I say? <laughs> I'm saving you, know, you for last. I'm saving the best for last. So you come in right, all right. after Andreas. Okay. Uh, listen, no, I'm joking. It doesn't matter, man. So it's, <laughs> um, you know, it, for me, it's easy. I mentioned Andreas because we're together like uh, I've been, like 15 years almost. Yeah. So uh, and, and besides the the professional life, we're uh, we're also a related family. I, I, I'm married. Uh, him, I was the, the best man in their, their marriage, uh, me and my wife. So uh, we share a lot of moments. But uh, it's also important what I, I brought Daryl as a, my ex-player, uh, you know, that uh, we worked together in Pau and Anton and Dennis and Kostas Hadzikristos and, and Pasha. 
uh, and all the other uh, associates that they have, doctors, physiotherapists, and of course the management, which is very important on daily basis we, we have. But if we talk strictly about coaching staff uh, and not the, the medical staff or the management, uh, I am the, um, from those coaches that I like to be challenged. I don't want the yes men around me. Um, I was the one uh, that I was going through that process with Jelko 13 years. Uh, that that what he appreciated uh, from me from the first moment you know all the relations are starting with doubts mm -hmm. friend, friend friendship uh loving affairs uh professional uh, relationship everything starts with a doubt yeah is he the right one is she the right one yeah is he for me is he sneaky is he going behind my back you have plenty of doubts when when you're coming to the situation you're going through you challenge them also you are testing them uh, uh, and that comes with experience i was tested by 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 Jelko back then i'm testing my my assistant coaches a lot of times but uh to to come straight forward to the answer i like when the coaches are come with the ideas and even though i might disagree uh i want them to defend their ideas with um uh with fundamental with, with with things that they can be you know uh so strong arguments so they can convince me why they support that idea mm -hmm. and i'm um, uh, from those coaches that i like to to hear them during the game as well from what they are um you know uh, their their speciality is if if andreas has to tell me hey this difference works so keep doing it, or this difference doesn't work change it or Anton can jump and say, listen, can we have a different guarding over there? Because that guy, when he's when, when, when we're switching, creating problems down there, or Daryl can go and talk to Joel Bolomboy about what he uh, messed up because uh, he did a uh, wrong in, in defense. Or Dennis, that he's doing a live scout. You know that we have a live scout and also yeah. in the half time yeah. we can go uh, 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 and analyzing things and put a picture on the, on the screen. It's different when coaches are talking, but it's different when you show it also on the screen. And not only the bad things, but also the good things, whatever it, it works, because you need to give a feedback, a good, a, a positive feedback to the players as well. Absolutely. Not only we used to, because uh, I worked back then with a lot of coaches, we used to say only criticism, like what are you doing wrong? But the players are waiting for us to, to say, hey, you're doing good this thing. So yeah. watch it. Wow, that, that works great. So it's great. Um, so. If I answer to your question, that's it. I, I, I like, I could have meet with uh, them more and more, but I understand their personal life. And we usually uh, come one hour before practice, we meet uh, and we explain that if it's necessary in some difficult moments, we might come in two and a half hours. Uh, it's normal that uh, with Andreas, I have a little bit more of a, uh, an uh, analytics uh, because of the relation and, and everything we have uh, so much so so much but i trust everybody's opinion i'm the, i'm from the coaches that before i take my decision i will ask everybody to say their opinion for for whatever reason who we're going to dress up you know that in vtb let's say we have that rule that from eight foreigners you have to dress up six so you got to sit down uh, two uh from what kind of a uh, starting lineup we're going to have what is the defense we're going to choose you know uh, when the coaches are going deep to the analysis, I trust their analysis. Though, because I was 13 years as an assistant coach and I was pre preparing a lot of games and getting into the, if I may say, to the brain of the opponent coach to see what what he's thinking, uh, I'm analyzing myself. So I, I, I try to, you know, I try to challenge them because uh, they know that I'm watching games. I, I'm not going to just leave it up to the air. I do trust their opinion. Yeah. I'm analyzing a lot uh, as well myself, but I, I'm going to ask them their opinion. And we're going to go straight forward without saying, hey, you're right, you're wrong. Uh, during the game, I might challenge them a little bit more uh, about uh, I'm being a little bit more of a, uh, emotional, let's say, in when things are not going good. But uh, just just to challenge them. Uh, at the same time, I might give them to run the, the, the practice in one practice. And I do that very often or run the timeout or uh, uh, run that game as well. So kind of prepare them for the next day yeah it's it's it, the, the justification has to always be on firm ground right the the, the assistant coach you have to have certain Definitely. amount of of like you know you always have to also be able to play the devil's advocate andreas said that also uh, when, when i talked to him 
but it there is you know i i had the experience where i i came into it uh, when i was with my first year my first couple of months with messina and i was like unprepared for exactly what you're saying i had an idea but at that point i did i was not capable of justifying why it's just again i'm a gut very and gut gut based intuition based but in those moments you have to have foundational uh justification you know to to in order to say yeah but if they do this then you can do this and this and that's this is you know there there has to be a progression of your of your uh, suggestion well fo foundational uh justification might be also that coach you know what you gotta feel my guts i analyzed 10 games and yeah, i see that that exactly. happened that's also foundational you know that that that's an also justification hey coach i watched 10 games you watch three all right do you want to trust me you trust me. You don't want to trust me. I, I got to say to you because I want to help you. That doesn't mean I'm right. I might, I might not be wrong. But you know what? You're going to be the voice, the loud voice or, or, or the second opinion of the coach that he has in his mind. Yeah. You want to hedge. I want to switch. But you go and say, no, hedge is the best difference. But I want to switch. And then you're going to go hedge. And then you're going to get, all right. So, you know, <laughs> you're going to have it over here. Yeah. Why? Because of that. Absolutely. That's absolutely. I mean, I, that, that, these are the dynamics I love really in the step where you, you know, you, you get to also look back on that later on, but you, you mentioned the live scouting. Can I ask how many clips maximum you, sh you can show in a short time frame at halftime? Well, from back then in, in years, because I was the one that I'm proudly saying that I will work with the VHS. Yeah. <laughs> Keep notes on one hour, 30 minutes, uh, 20 seconds is that one clip. So put the tape in, run it, like make that. So now you got um, uh, uh, the, the the computers and that's summarizing. You know, uh, we talk with Andres and Anton and Dar a lot about that. I think we can keep the, the, the players concentrated for 20 minutes on the, on the video session, uh, give them like, quick clips of what we, we're watching and we're trying whatever we're analyzing to try to work on a court. So mm -hmm. if we, let's say, analyze the, their defense, we're going to go work out there for our offense. We, if we watch them, their offense, we're going to go work over their defense. If now the amount of time is not helping us because we have back-to-back -back games, uh, as it happens now in Europe and also in NBA, we might go and uh, try to summarize it in 30 minutes and, and give the um, individual, uh, uh, the personnel, Try yeah. to analyze the personnel and try to uh, see and be focused on the main uh, situation. So uh, we had some long meetings, though, uh, when it's some bad. So we're talking about the analysis and the cut clips. That's different. But I'm, I'm in favor of when we have some upsets, I'm going to watch the whole game. But when I say I'm going to go watch the whole game, I'm not going to watch with the popcorns and, uh, you know, like Coca-Cola or something and go, let it go, we're going to analyze the game and take us three and a half hours. Yeah. We're going to analyze and take us four hours, like clip and clip. Why this? Why that? The detail. And when I see them, maybe like, like something, I, now you lead the, so they, they kind of, you know, I, I pretty much have a, a voice that everybody can hear. So I'm not, they're not going to sleep. Although I had an, uh, uh, I give you maybe one good uh, thing, a player, light in a it happened also back back then and he kind of was sleepy because six o'clock in the morning he had to talk with his uh, wife in the united yeah. states so um yeah that's that's the there are long meetings there are short meetings for sure uh, whatever but, the situation uh, ask from you but at at, at halftime in the in the heat of the moment you 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 have to keep it short so what's what's yes. the time what's the time frame? Um, like in, in three, a half time, uh we always use them, uh, used to leave them a little bit to discuss there, take their breath and discuss there, whatever happens. Also in timeouts. And that's PT. I'm trying to ask from the uh, EuroLeague uh, uh, Union of Coaches and also the EuroLeague uh, Game Department to extend a little bit the timeout. You know, I, I really value the 15 seconds that we gather as coaches. If you see me and I, everybody yes. says his opinion, then I go with one idea to the to the timeout. But in Europe, the timeout is one minute. And on 50 seconds, the, the referee is coming and said, come, because I'm going to call you a second timeout. I said, 
you know, try to be a little bit more cooperative. I'm not going against the game. I'm not going against the TV rights or so whatever. Like, try to extend a little bit the time up. But coming back to your question, like in the halftime, um, maybe three clips, two clips, you know, one in defense, yeah. one in offense, or two in defense and three in defense. It didn't work that. So it depends. Well, like you say, like if you're talking about the timeouts also, it, thinking about it from the marketing aspect, which you work with ice cream and you talked about marketing as well, it's a good advertisement tool to have 30 extra seconds instead of 60 seconds, 90 seconds for the for the for the league to have a little bit more thank you income. I, I said, <laughs> yeah, thank I said that. I said hey, that probably. you're gonna help the coaches. Yeah. We need, you know. I, don't, I think that the majority of coaches will be in favor. I, I, I talk with them and they will, will yeah. be in favor. I hope that they're going to extend it a little bit. I asked, I, I was the one in Panathinaikos back then to ask that halftime not to be 15 minutes, but to extend it to 20. But then they came to TV rights and said, listen, the basketball game, it, it goes how much? Like two hours? This we can give you. But if it goes more above that, then the schedule and how it goes, the, the oh. time on TV, it's difficult, so I kind of understand them. Like, it's not going to be like tennis. Tennis is going to go like maybe three hours, maybe four, maybe five, maybe yeah. two. In basketball, they need to have a strict this two hours or whatever it is like to, to give you. So within these two hours, they, you got to fit everything. That's most probably why they don't extend also to go in the quarter 12 minutes instead of, you know, playing now 10. So yeah. in NBA, you have 12. Over here, you have 10. So we got kind of try to make compromises here and there to, to help them, help us. Do their that makes best. sense. That makes sense. Um, so, moving on to the third quarter, I know like we're we're we've been talking for an hour, just respecting your time. Um, I would like to still. Wow, talk. we're talking for an hour. Yeah, it it flies by. So, like this this maybe, conversation. Maybe we, we, maybe we got cut and go in second time. So let's, let's <laughs> go third quarter and fourth quarter just like that. Spin it All up. right. All right. So anything you did different, we're reflecting now a little bit on your on, on, on your experiences, anything you did different 10, 15 years ago that you're not doing anymore and you look back on, it's like, all right, I have to adjust. And this is the main thing I adjusted. Definitely. Uh, the, the amount of practice, the, the, the um, how, how strong you're going to go in practice uh, and the approach to the players and communication with them. Uh, there are many things uh, that uh, have changed. I can tell you uh, when I was uh, head coach of Filipos Thessalonikis or men, the, the A2 division, not well-known teams, but uh, in my heart, uh, uh, because I spent very, very important years over there, we could have worked like hours and hours, like yeah. two and a half hours, three hours or so, whatever. And especially when you have one game in a week, the, the players that were exhausted. I remember one veteran that I sent him from Aris to help us uh, get into the first division. Uh, he came in one practice because he was veteran, and he says to me, "Coach, I signed for Filipos. I didn't sign for Real Madrid. If I knew that you're going to have so much of video sessions and practices and weightlifting and everything, how I could have stayed in third or fourth division? I try to retire." And he was smiling, of course. Like we were over practicing uh, sometimes. I, I, I dare to say that it was different times, different, yeah. um, different pressure for the players. Now the players are going. You know, with more games, if you see those elite players that they're playing also national teams, they go unbelievable, yeah, 100, 100 games. So, and with this, um, this pressure they have, we need to have certain adjustments uh, as well as coaches. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really good you mentioned that. You know, obviously, the condensed schedule forces you to, 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 to be more efficient, but also Brad Stevens and our people, coaches who visited our, our preseason or, or uh, just preparation process. The, the one thing that everybody comes away is saying is that how time efficient the practices are and with, with Brad Stevens, it's just like everything is so condensed, just focused on like, let's, let's get through this, let's go bam, 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 you know, and you, 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 the, the volume, the volume is condensed into like an hour, hour, 15, 20 minutes, but it's focused, exactly. it's focused. And the intensity level has to be there to compete and you get through it and, and everybody can go on working individually or get treatment or whatever, but you have to be there for an hour, hour, 15 minutes and you just get out of there. That, that's exactly what we do right now. Like the main practices during the season, it, it cannot be more than one 15, one 10 or something. Sometimes you may have very effective practice in 55 minutes uh, and being there and have everything what you want to go through then if you're going to go extend 145 and you're losing just 30 minutes out there, definitely yeah. players will come earlier, shoot with the coaches, do some individual skill work out, or maybe go into the lift, having the video. 
but this 115 or one hour compete, as you said, compete on the highest level. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's one more thing, actually two more things I would like to reflect on. First of all, one thing or the biggest struggle when you, like the rich experience you had at Panathinaikos and you went to become a head coach, what was the biggest challenge or the early struggle that you felt like, because you were a head coach before you went to Panathinaikos, then you became an assistant coach and then you went back to being a head coach with a rich experience. What was the one sh challenge you felt like that was something that you were struggling with early on? Well, again, I'm going to go to listen to your guts and listen what you, what you what your feelings are. Because there are many thousand experts out there, including journalists or thousand uh, and friends in my family too, that they know, oh, go and get that offer. Oh, go, go get that offer. But you ready? What you like? Go get that. Like they know better than you what is better for you, you know, and what how you feel it. Well, I put it that way. Um, in my 13 years in, in POW, I had three very important offers to, to get out of an assistant job, maybe the most, um, let's say, um, advertised or whatever, like the, the well-known it was that when Kereheta called me uh, twice, actually, to, to take over uh, uh, Basconia. And, uh, you know, I, and I, I had to re reject that offer, with, which was very respectful. And I, of course, I thank him many times and now we have a great relation, but, um, back then i was fulfilled of what i was doing and i had a commitment of what i was doing you know that that doesn't mean that I, you cannot go out there and have an interview but i was very committed on what i was doing and uh, you know i i never regret the the moments uh, i had this is the experience i gained I, um the respect i had for my head coach Jacob was giving me plenty of space over there to operate to teach to work with the players as i said and to to being ready for grabbing the next job, either that is in Banvit or even that it was in Pau when I became first time as a head coach at the year of 25. Uh, I was one of the youngest coaches in, in this sport, coaching Peja Stojakovic, uh, Prelevic, or uh, Dean Garrett, those guys that they, they play in NBA afterwards. So, um, you know, at, when, when the circle was finished and we stayed in one year out, uh, 2012, together with Jelko, preparing the next possible uh, uh, destination. Uh, uh, I thought a lot uh, and I, I had, we had a lot of clinics together also. I think that we had like six or seven clinics. We went around the world, like from Dubai to Sweden to Belgrade, Athens or whatever. We had a lot of clinics and um, my phone and my agent's phone never stopped uh, calling. And I said, all right. Uh, and I talked with Jacob first. It was the, the person that when Banvit came with, uh, with the offer, I, tell, I told him, you know, I feel like that's the time. So uh, I feel good. And especially because the team is not, I don't know, uh, a, 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 a brand name. I'm going to start from there. It's a good environment. And I, I never regret what I did. So it, it, it comes with a, with a situation. It comes from the, you know, as I said, from the gods, from the feeling. So yeah. I, it's not any specific advice out there. But if I can give one advice, Staying commitment, committed on what you did. And if you're fulfilled and you feel that you belong, when you feel that you belong somewhere, you're going to give your best self. Regardless if you're a first assistant coach, second assistant coach, third assistant coach, you're a trainer, you're the head. If you feel that you belong, I felt that I belonged over there. That's I felt that I had a mission to accomplish. And I was really happy with what I was doing. The only thing I was not happy because I didn't have an answer when my, my daughter, she was younger, and I was going to say, and that's a funny story. I said, where are you going, Daddy? I, I, I said, I'm going to work. And she, she replies to me, but Daddy, can I ask you something? Why the work is not coming one time at home? And you always have to go to the... To the. So that was, that, was, that was an answer that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, you know, say to explain to her. Um, yeah, it's, it's so also important for the leaders to make the, the staff or the, the people below you to make feel them make them feel valuable like like they belong you know like you yeah, feel you, you felt like you belong but there was people up 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 above you like Jelko or the organization who made you feel that way and i think a lot of organizations uh wherever like it's it, it's taken for granted you know and then there's workers assistant coaches coaches staff members whatever they feel like what am I like? Nobody's listening to me. Like, I mean, I, I'm doing my job. I'm, I'm loving what I do. But if, if you don't feel like you're a part of something, even the smallest 
even like that's what I love that says Scott, even the cleaning ladies, everybody felt like they're they're, they're part of this idea, right? There's they're, there's they're part of something bigger than them and they're contributing. Well, if if is that the case and you feel that you're being ignored, then be persistent. Be persistent and you're gonna find a way. Yeah, because if yeah. you're gonna be persistent, you're gonna prevail eventually. But you need to be persistent on what are your uh, defending what is your ideas so at one point if your ideas and your values uh are need to be listened they're going to be listened so be persistent if you don't feel that you belong you better go uh, other way just go other way because True. eventually the if you don't go somebody else is going to kick you out but uh if you feel that you you you're not hurt you're going to be hurt if you're going to be persistent very good advice so fourth quarter, I don't know if it's fourth quarter or overtime, but I'm, I'm going to philosophy because you mentioned values and I would like to cling on this and put a pin in the, into the principles and values of a person. There's a lot of parallels, right? That we also always see when, whenever you are an open person, open coach, open personality, you can find correlations between life and the sport you're, 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 you're pursuing, like whether it's basketball, football, as a coach, you, you can see parallels and you can sometimes have metaphors that are like used like the knives in the mouth. You can, you can, you can draw it from real life experiences, which experiences or values principles in, in, in essence, you see transferring from your life to the game fluently that you feel like that's something I want my players also to, to have what I feel in, in my personal life that I have that needs to be transferred on the court. And that's one thing that the players need to understand. Well, it, I can connect it with the third quarter because we have a transition from the third quarter to the fourth quarter. Bro. We talk about the, the, the assistant coaches not to be heard. Uh, allow me to say that the assistant coaches need to have an empathy. And, and that word is very important, an empathy of what the head coach is going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So you got if you want to be heard, you got to try to be in the shoes of this guy of what is going through the pressure, the, the challenges of players are not playing that much. They have everything, media, whatever it is, family, everything. All right. So you got to have a little bit of em empathy or empathy in general. So I have empathy for my players, too, mm -hmm. of what they're going through. I do explain them in the beginning of the summer again. What you're gonna go in through, like how you're gonna, how it's gonna look to play for a winning team and a winning culture. So uh, uh, empathy is the, the the first for sure. But uh, during the game, uh, I want them. I want to lead by example. I, I can't be caught not not to be concentrated. I can't allow that to myself. Not going prepared to a game. It doesn't matter the game. You know, you might play that game against allow me to say with all the respect to Astana that you know you're going to beat them 20 or 30. That doesn't mean I'm not going to scout the game. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be prepared with my ATOs, with my, uh, you know, uh, sub possible substitutions, different defenses, my schedule. So I, I, I got to lead by example. If if I'm respectful to the, the club I'm representing, if I'm respectful to the, to the organization, if I'm respectful to the practices, if I'm concentrated and ready 24-7 for you, I need you to be there for me as well. So I, I believe that um, we are under the radar of the players as coaches. Players are always feeling you as well. When we feel them, when we see them, their body, body language, they know your body language too. Yeah. How you've been dressed, how you've been, uh, if you're shaved, how, what is your jersey, what, what shoes you're wearing, um, how you smell, how you, everything is important in life because this is a mind, mind game. And it's a mind game with the opponent, but it's a mind game with your associates, with your with your colleagues, with your players. So I want them to be concentrated and motivated uh, uh, consistently. And if they don't feel it, you better inform me. Like a day before, hour before or something, because we're all humans. We might not have a good day. Yeah. All right, that's acceptable. Like, let's have an information. But I think that a lot of values we have on sport uh, I like when I talk with players like my ex-players, like Johnny Rogers, for instance, that he's working now in NBA, or I don't know, Odet Katas, that he's now head coach of Panathinaikos, and many others, I can mention names. I, I really appreciate the, the way we talk now, and they 
they now going back from their really tremendous career they had as a players and now they tra tra transfer it to a GM career or to the head coach career and they go to another side of the river like I used to say I say welcome now to the other side <laughs> now you got to think about everybody not only your, yourself now you can see it how, how how it looks or Saras let's say Saras now is being you know I, I had a, a really close relation with Saras as a player and a coach an assistant coach back then right I was the one I uh, you know I tried I defended him in, in certain situations in his personal life and in his playing life because he was not playing the first years the way everybody was expecting from him or from himself as well. And he had to solve some other issues. So that's very important. Empathy is very important. And um, following a lot of those important uh, values and, and, and uh, you know, ethics you have in, in sport, in life as well. Because at the end of the day, if we can prepare the, the next generations to be out there and vote for the right person and uh, uh, respect others' rights, you know, we did a great job. Maybe we haven't won titles, but we prepared the other generation. I talk about the, the, the junior coaches and I, I talk about the youth uh, coaches. Maybe those guys, the kids that they're coming and watch, they're not going to be the next Kurbanov or the next Will Clyburn or the next uh, uh, Pogasov, but they're going to be a great fans. They're going to know the sports. They're going to know how what basketball uh, represents and the ethics uh, out there. So compete, yes, within the four lines, yes. Uh, have the values after that in life. So know when an elder person comes to help him, do it out of your without expecting something from yes. life. Yes. Do something yeah. good, and then the life will treat you back. I said that if you don't respect the game, then the game the game will not respect you back for sure. That's the law of, of basketball. That's the law of life. You, you don't respect, they're not going to respect you out there, for sure. This is a great summary of everything we talked about right now, you know, from integrity, from, from empathy, from the trust you have to have in your staff, everything, you know, like you, you have to respect the work you put in in order to get the respect back, basically. And that's always something that um, even with Ettore, that's the same thing that he's also talked about, you know, like you assistant coaches have to respect their job and they have to empathize with the with the with the coach and put themselves in his shoes everything is i feel that with with high achievers there is this continuity of of respecting the work you, you do day in day out and like you said to be persistent to be persistent in what you do and then you will get the reward automatically at a certain point there's not a timeline on it but you will get you will get rewarded for it one way or the other Last but not least, if you don't have that fire, you better step aside. If you still have that fire in you, if you're a head coach or assistant coach, keep going, keep doing it. You need to, to have that fire. You said something uh, before that, and I, I forgot, but I bring it back. This all success you had as an assistant coach, as a head coach, let them rest in peace. That's a past. We have a future. That's a new challenge. And I, I put a lot of goals and uh, small goals small targets in front of me every 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 day uh, every practice small goals you, you need to achieve the other goals are let them rest in peace as you said that's that's a great thing what you said so let them rest in peace and move forward as soon as you have that fire you feel fulfilled and you feel that you belong go out there and, and fight brilliant brilliant so now we're we're crossing paths at the game is over we're going to shake hands but before we right. before before we say goodbye, I would like to have to know your the one habit that you do or one, one book that you read maybe currently that's helping you to take the edge off things. What is something that you could give to listeners uh, to 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 read? Allow me to take that book, I'll please. That's the last I finished now. Leaders eat last. By Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. Perfect. Right. Awesome. Right, right now, right now I'm listening to that book. So I really recommend it to many coaches. Allow me to open the because we have now the audiobook. So yeah. Andreas teach me that. <laughs> As a <laughs> IT guy. As just a sec. I don't know why he's not connected. It's Pep Guardiola's book. Ah, okay. Uh, a trial lesson from soccer. Uh, very, very, very well uh, said. I had some connection problem over here in my iPad. So 
Pep Guardiola. Okay, I, I, yeah. I'll find I'll find it. I was I was reading Alex Ferguson's uh, book. Oh, well, I read that. I read yeah. that. Also, also great book. Great book. Yes. Let me let me make one more try. Yes. That's Where is Andreas when you need him? Pep. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So All right. Great book. So. Excellent coach, Efkaristo, and uh, good luck in the final four. Baracalo. Stay healthy, all right? Always, always. Of cold showers, health. <laughs>